computer. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Stephen McCluskey. I'm the director of the Center for Global Education. And you're all extremely welcome to this special event organized as part of the Imagine Festival of Ideas and Politics. Uh, the event is on the Fridays for Future Climate Strike Movement. And with me to discuss it, I have uh, three special guests. Um, I have Anna Kernahan, who's uh, an 18 year old climate justice and ecological activist from Belfast, whose school strikes as a part of Fridays for Future. Caitlin Laverty is a 19 year old climate activist and environmental filmmaker from the north of Ireland. She's involved in Fridays for Future Extinction Rebellion and participates in weekly climate strikes in Belfast. And Linda Sullivan works for Friends of the Earth, Northern Ireland, supporting communities impacted by extractivism. She lived and worked with communities in Latin America for five years opposing mega mining. And the way we're going to structure this conversation is we're going to use four questions that we have pre-agreed that'll hopefully tease out the main issues around the climate strikes and, and what we want to discuss um, during this, this special event. So to get things moving, the first question is a fairly straightforward one. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Caitlin, if that's okay. It's basically um, trying to explain the success of the climate strike movement in mobilizing so many people around the world to get involved with them. Because I think um, in the last big climate strike that we had in September, 2019, there were somewhere in the region of about seven and a half million people involved in hundreds of cities across the world. Why do you think this issue has resonated so widely across across the world? Yeah, I think um, I agree. Like the, the climate movement has really taken off in such a big way recently. Um, I think a crucial element of this lies in our access to information online. Uh, people are doing their research on the science and realizing that this is a problem that has been grossly overlooked. And I think that also plays into the massive youth platform we have within the climate movement as social media is a fantastic way of reaching a large audience. You're on mute there, Stephen. Sorry, apologies. Anna. Same question. I mean, you've been very, very much involved in the climate strikes in Belfast right from the very from the very start. And you've seen them grow in terms of uh, popular participation. I mean, why do you think that they've um, struck a chord with the public and got been so successful? Um, I think that here um, it's been a really accessible way of getting involved, you know, Extinction Rebellion do a lot of illegal stuff. Other things are more like charities and NGOs, and it's more of like something you have to be an adult to participate in, whereas it doesn't matter what age you are to join a climate strike. And it is something that you can just go along to. There's no commitment and everyone's really, really friendly. Um, and I think because it was happening all over the world, it made people more inclined to do it here as well. Um, and I think the fact that we have no climate laws whatsoever makes it something that is people were looking for an outlet to do something and climate striking just happened to be that thing. There were people who knew about the science but didn't know what to do and suddenly this thing came along that anyone could join no matter what your age or anything um, and it just happened to be the thing that stuck. That's obviously a strength, Anna, the fact that um, anyone can participate and it's very open ended. In terms of pressing um, demands and trying to seek policy change, do you think that's a weakness, the fact that it's so open ended and that's so global that it doesn't really have a leadership or does it have a leadership? What do, what do you think? If you mean Fridays for Future specifically, there's no leadership. It's a grass roots ground up movement um, there's no hierarchy at all um, I think that the lack of specificity is a, not a weakness but it's a benefit because we have a set of international demands and that means that every country can be included and we're not leaving anyone out 
because if we were to make them more specific, then it wouldn't apply to every country and every continent because there's so much diversity in terms of how the climate crisis is affecting some people more than others. Um, so it has to be broad and it means that we can have more people joining the fight. If you make it too niche, then not everyone can get involved and it becomes a weakness. But some national groups would have their own more specific demands. So um, as well as the international ones. So that if that was to become a weakness, it has been overcome. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Linda, you work for an NGO, Friends of the Earth, which has been very supportive of, of the, the, the climate strike movement. What's your perspective on, on why the, the climate strikes have been so successful? I know you participated in the September um, 2019 event in Belfast, which generated a huge public response. Why do you think it is? Why do you think it's generating um, such a lot of public appeal? Yeah, I think um, in part it goes to what Caitlin was saying that like access to information, you know, um, like IPCC report um, came out like you know, shortly before that. And it was the first time where people had um, easy access to um, to the evidence, you know, all in one place, you know, the evidence was there before, but maybe people didn't know where to find it or what evidence to trust. So this was like um, trusted um, scientific, like internationally um, recognized um, very stark dramatic evidence that we um, are in trouble and that we're on the wrong track. Um, so with that, I think that was a big spur for people to to get up and do something, you know, to, and also seeing, especially here, you know, seeing the political vacuum and the lack of, of political will to actually do anything about it. So people thought um, and led by young people that we need to take to the streets, you know, and for me, like a big part of it, of the attraction was um, like the, the joy, the enthusiasm, even though it's a really heavy, um, scary thing, like um, the joy when people come together to fight for something they believe in is um, like very inspiring. And that's very, um, very attractive, you know, and, and for this to be a sustainable fight um, and um, like we're in it for the long haul, it needs to, it needs to have that. It needs to bring people together and to be about building community um, and resilience if, um, as well as um, holding party account. Thank you, Linda. Um, Caitlin, one of the great strengths of the climate strike movement and, and really the engine of it from the, from the very start was about bringing people out onto the streets and, and protesting in a very active way, in a very visible way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But over the last year, it hasn't really been possible to do that because of the pandemic, because we've been in a succession of lockdowns. Mm -hmm, yeah. So how have you and, and other activists in the, in the Fridays for Future movement or indeed Extinction Rebellion mm -hmm. been trying to keep the issue in the public eye and keep the public consciousness going of the importance of climate? Yeah, I mean, we've had to drastically change the way that we carry out our activism, so it's being done in a safe way. Um, social media plays a major role in keeping up campaign momentum with like interactive activities, such as the hashtag climate strike online. And it works in such a way that you can protest by just posting on social media without having to meet up. Um, and then, of course, Anna and I also carry out our weekly socially distant climate strikes, which we post online as well. Um, so, yeah, that's just it's a really important platform. And Anna, you're you're still in school, so. But but having to homeschool, I'm, I'm assuming. So how have you tried to keep keep this issue um, alive in terms of your engagement with other students and within the wider school environment, but not being able to go to school? Um, well, apart from school striking itself, um, schools aren't exactly supportive of school strikes because you're skipping the school. Um, but individual teachers would. Um, just last week, I was asked to record a video for the junior science class who are learning about the environment um, so that they could learn more about the climate strikes. So like 
there is still stuff happening online and there's no reason to say that they can't access the science that we're seeing online because I mean the coronavirus crisis is obviously something we need to take into consideration and treat really really seriously but that doesn't mean that we treat the climate crisis any less seriously so we're trying to keep up the same momentum but just going through a separate channel so all the same things are still happening all the things that we were yelling on the streets we're now writing in tweets and it's still going and the people are still there it just might not be as physically visible and I think it's the same with school like if anything people have more time to be online and to see those kinds of things and and from an NGO perspective Linda it's been a very difficult I mean I know for myself from my own point of view working in the Centre for Global Education it's been a very difficult year having to adapt it the, the way that we've worked um, to, to an online delivery rather than face to face. I have friends of the earth try to keep um, the public momentum going in terms of interest in, in the, the climate issue uh, when we've been forced to lock down during the, the COVID pandemic. Yeah, it's it's been hard because, you know, people are are struggling, um, you know, working mothers who also have to take care of their children, um, people who have maybe lost their jobs, people who are um, are ill, you know, there's people who have uh, family members in, in care homes that like there's, there's so many issues people are dealing with um, and maybe feeling isolated and, and struggling with their mental health. So like um, it's not a time to, um, to demand more than people can give. Um, but it's also like keeping the door open for people who are in a position to, to keep on campaigning and, and keep on organizing. Um, like as, a, as an organization, what we've been doing is, um, well, we've been pushing for a strong climate act that, that we don't have. Um, and there's a private member's bill going through um, Stormont at the minute. So that's been one of our focuses to try to um, make sure that that goes through before time runs out, um, you know, on this mandate. Um, and it's a cross party supported climate act. And then on the back of that, what needs to happen is um, like there needs to be strong climate action plans put in place, uh, both at a government and council level um, and government department level. So we have um, we have brought together uh, climate action plans for councils and for government um, that we um, believe um, is a way forward um, and is a way that governments can take um, the action that is needed, but this needs to be adopted, um, you know, yesterday. <laughs> so it needs pressure, it needs, um, yeah, it, it needs activism really to make this a reality because I've both seen up to now, if there, if there isn't that push in, then they're not gonna do it. You know? And is there a joined up approach to this campaigning between Friends of the Earth and the Fridays for Future movement? Or do you take the view as an organization that Fridays for Future is led by young people? They determine the direction of, of the, the movement and it's really up to them as to where they focus their efforts. What, what kind of approach do you, do you take to Fridays for Future in that regard? Yeah, like um, we've always been very supportive of, of Fridays for Future, uh, the, um, the climate movement, the, the strike movement. Um, and also, like, I have I've learned a lot of how to mobilize um, from participating in the climate strikes. Um, like, yeah, I think the real future um, for activism lies in grassroots groups. Um, you know, NGOs supporting where possible, but like the real um, energy and um, the real kind of power is is in the grassroots. Thanks, Linda. So, Caitlin, we're beginning to see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine program and the possibility that there may be in the not too distant future some kind of um, Normality. I, I love using that, that term because it was normality that got us into the hot water of the climate emergency in the first place. Uh, we need a different reality to the old one. But 
what I mean is in, in terms of being able to get out and about and mobilize again and, and, and protest and, and all of that, um, it should be possible to do that in the, the not too distant future. What do you think Fridays for Future needs to focus on going forward as, as a policy objective? Are you basically in alignment with what um, Linda has just said, or do you look more broadly than that? Do you look at the, the global picture and um, global objectives in regard to um, curbing emissions and reaching that 1.5% target, which is, which is critical? Um, so where do you think the movement needs to go from here? Um, I think the climate movement as a concept is doing as much as it can at the moment. We have the facts, we have the science to back it up. We have a platform and we are trying our very best to project our voices. Uh, what needs to change is the attitudes of the government officials, the attitudes of those in the positions of power. They are the people who can actually ensure that we definitely meet the 1.5 degree limit on global warming. Would you go along with that, Anna, or do you do you have a different perspective in terms of where the where the movement needs to go next in terms of um, policy change, as well as not just policy change, but in terms of how you mobilize and how you operate as a movement? Have you any thoughts on on where it should go next um, um, post lockdown? Well, I, I agree with Caitlin, um, but just to add on to that, I think that. If anything, um, being in lockdown has almost strengthened the movement internally. So externally, we had you know millions of people taken to the streets. But Fridays for Future is such an international movement. It's like it's so you know you're on a call, um, just like a regular general call, and there's people from like six continents all all communicating at the same time. And so because we've had to go online, we've had to. Um, overcome those it's made us more intersectional in our fight for climate justice because having to adapt to so many different cultures colliding and different languages and things like that so I think that going forward whenever we do start to slowly open up again we have that internal structure that is much stronger um, and more we're all closer together we're more we have more friendships and I think that people work a lot better whenever they know people um, and there's a lot more networking that has happened over lockdown because Zoom calls are easier than physical meetings anyway. So I think that um, if anything, the movement is going to keep getting bigger, keep getting better and keep getting stronger, um, as is the climate crisis pushing back against us. So um, that's needed. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to come back with newfound motivation and strength. I just realized that we're nearly into half an hour. We're half an hour into this conversation and we haven't mentioned Greta Thunberg once. That's that's kind of crazy. But is she critical? Is she critical to the success of the movement, Anna, do you think? Or do you think that Greta Thunbergs have started to spring up all over the world, inspired by by her and by her activism, and that she's already done an awful lot in terms of um the inspiration that she's provided through her the way she deals with policymakers and with her her activism that that sparked the whole thing with her solitary protest at the Swedish Parliament. What well, what do you think about her role in the movement? Um, well, I feel strange speaking for her, like she's her own person. But like, what she would say is that. She sees herself as just one of like many in the movement and no more, no less. Like, yeah, she started it, but she doesn't want to have any more like ownership over it than anyone else who goes climate striking. Um, but in terms of the media, the media definitely highlight her. Um, so even whenever she does interviews and deliberately asks people of color and people from MAPA, the most affected people in areas, to come to interviews, they still talk to Greta first. Um, so I think she's important in terms of having a Eurocentric media that we have to somehow cater to. Um, but in terms of the movement in general, um, aside from the media, um, I think Greta's amazing and really fun and really motivated and really good hard worker who always has amazing ideas. Um, but so do so many people in so many countries all over the world. 
Um, Linda, we've been in a pandemic for the, for the last year, and um, I just wondered whether there were any things that we could learn from government responses to, to the pandemic in terms of the way uh, resources have been suddenly mobilized to, for example, put people on furlough um, and to, to be allowed businesses. Um, is there anything that we can learn about, and, and also the, the way growth has suddenly slowed as well, um, has had an impact on, on the climate? I just wondered whether there were any things, any lessons we can learn from the response to COVID-19 right across the world that might have a bearing on how we deal with the climate the climate problem or the climate emergency? Yeah, well, the first thing to say that many other people have already said is um, this is what an emergency looks like. You know, it's very clear that um, government can take strong, decisive action when needed um, when faced with an emergency. So why not do the same when faced with a climate emergency? Um, you know, like like you said, like the furlough scheme, the like the the amount of um, protections that uh, like um, given homeless people a roof over their heads, you know, like these are things that should be done um, anyway, uh, you know, and the fact that um, you know there is actually a money tree, <laughs> you know. Yes like the understanding of, of economics that uh, we're led to believe is actually false you know that um governments can um create money they can they create money by borrowing and um, it's not the, the kind of household um like you you borrow and then you pay back you know it's like if you look at the um modern monetary theory um it explains that like that's just not true you know like governments can create money when needs be they have done when they want to, to bail out the banks um or bail out big industries so why can't they do it um when like huge finance is needed um to tackle the climate crisis you know and, and part of that um is um to to like who huge finances needed to support um, countries in the global south to cope with climate shocks and also to become more um, climate resilient. Um, and so that's just not happening, you know, promises that have been made um, just haven't been fulfilled and, and still we extract from the global south, you know, in terms of debt, in terms of um, resources, um, in terms of, of destroying through war and um, extraction, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I can't even remember what the question was. <laughs> Less, lessons that we can learn from COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, it, okay. I, yeah, I hear so... what you're saying, that we need to be more generous to countries in the global south and, and fair. Yeah, not, it's not even, yeah, not not even about being generous, but um, just, getting off their I backs, think. basically. Yeah, I suppose like a just transition means that um, we stop um, extracting from the global south we we kind of address these um still persisting colonial um, relationships um and we concentrate on degrowth in the global south or sorry in the global north um that has brought us these crises so and as we have seen like um when the economy stands still and um, you can still like meet um people's needs you know so it's like this this idea of constant growth of of um, using GDP as a indicator of of success is what has got us into this mess, um, and we need to move away from that, and actually look at um, how we can develop a, an economy based on well being, um, that doesn't leave um, people behind like this one is doing. Do you think, Linda, that people understand the connection between the economy and climate change, as in, you know, one driving the other, the fact that we have this relentless pursuit of growth by both governments and multinational corporations, which is generating most of the, the CO2 emissions go, going into the atmosphere. Do people understand that, do you think? Or do you think there's a job of work that needs to be done to, to make that, that clear? 
I think yeah, definitely more work needs to be done. Um, and you would see it in like the call for renewables, like um, and kind of in thinking that if we just switch to renewables uh, without changing any part of the system, that um, that will be enough to avoid climate catastrophe. Um, it's not, you know, um, if we continue with um, our amount of consumption, our amount of production, our amount of waste. Um, you know, we're going to continue to destroy ecosystems. We're going to continue to um, to um, just swamp the earth in waste. So the climate crisis is um, is one consequence. Um, it's not the cause. You know, the, the cause is the system. The cause is capitalism. The cause is dualism. Like you know, thinking that we are separate to and above nature. Um, yeah, so it's like addressing the root causes of um, of inequality, of injustice, which then would also tackle the climate crisis. Thanks, yeah. Linda. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, Caitlin, still same question to you. I mean, any lessons that we can learn from from the, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in terms of how we, we address the question of, of the climate emergency? Yeah, I think it's a very simple, straightforward lesson. You know, when people's lives are in danger, we have to take action. And it's not a good idea to leave dealing with it to the last minute until it becomes unmanageable. It's the exact same message that everyone's been promoting during the pandemic. And of course, it's scary and difficult to really think about until it affects your own life in some way. Uh, but I think our society has developed a sort of collective trauma from this past year when every element of our ordinary day to day lives was just completely thrown out the window. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, with this wide scale chaos and uncertainty, people are beginning to think about the wider picture um, and how we need to work together in order to spread awareness and protect and support the most vulnerable people during a crisis. And that's that is the next step to apply those same rules to the climate crisis. Would you agree with that, Anna? Um, or would you have a different take to um, lessons that we should learn from the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of dealing with the climate emergency? Um, I agree with Caitlin. I think um, it's quite a hopeful thing to see how we were able to completely change how we work and shut everything down virtually overnight this time last year. And it's still going on. And it did work, you know, whenever we go into lockdown, cases do go down and now we have a vaccine and like we're coming to terms with it and creating solutions and learning to live with it. But I think that um, now that we know that that's possible, then we need to ensure that that is done for the climate crisis. Um, because that's what we're always told. Like, I know, like Caitlin will know, like whenever we talk to politicians, I would say, yeah, but that's such a huge thing, like we can't just stop admitting. That's such a big abstract concept. But actually, if you do want to stop something overnight, you have proof that you can. So like if they do want to stop emissions and put in place a plan to do that, then they, they can, they have no excuse now. So I think that um, there's a very strong link to attitude there. And I think it also shows how we treat people um, because the climate crisis is um, a human rights issue as well as just an ecological one. Um, and coronavirus has shown just how much government care about people um, and how they're going to react whenever people are in danger, which they are for the climate crisis. It's just that in Belfast right now, it's not as obvious. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I, one commentator said um, about COVID and climate that people still seem to think that the climate emergency is something really far away in the distance, you know, that it's not something that's immediate and, and happening right now, whereas COVID-19 was regarded as something that was immediate that needed to be addressed straight away. And, and I wondered if that was your sense of it as well. It's clearly not that it's that attitude is clearly not there among those who have been involved in the climate strikes, but do you think that's still out there to some extent among the public that the climate emergency is still decades away and we've still got time to sort it out? Yes and no. I think that um, 
the coronavirus panic kind of that happened where everyone was immediately was scared to go outside happened because governments were doing something. You know, if your government makes it illegal to not wear a face mask on a bus, then that is some kind of apocalyptic thing that you would read in um, a futuristic novel. Um, but it, it's our reality. And so people were starting to take it seriously. Um, but because the people in power, the people we're seeing in the media, that we voted into power, who are meant to be making decisions on our behalf, are not doing anything about the climate crisis. They're treating it as if it's not a problem. And so it makes sense that people don't have the same sense of urgency. And there's also not um, education around it. I mean, unless you are actively interested in the climate crisis, you have no reason to look up IPCC reports and read them if you, if you don't really think about it. Um, and it's not really taught in schools. And if it is, it, it's very limited and most of it isn't even accurate. Um, so I think that people can act the way they did in coronavirus, but we need people in power and people who people look up to. Um, not necessarily people in power, like not always politicians, but even like um, big corporations, the hundred companies that are responsible for over 70% of global emissions, things like that. Like if people are seeing that and nothing is changing and people are allowed to continue to do these things, then why wouldn't you keep doing the same thing? Um, but also something that you said about people's reaction, I think something we also need to keep in mind is that like, it isn't the general public's fault and it's not their like they aren't the ones who should be have the burden of educating themselves. It should be the politicians and the people in power who are actually doing huge damage. Like someone not switching their light off by accident one time isn't causing the climate crisis. It's the huge multinational corporations. So I think that even if we didn't have that awareness, like there's still that responsibility of destruction of the many on the heads of people of very, very few. Linda, I'm really glad that Anna brought things back to education because that's very close to my heart here in the Centre for Global Education in terms of raising awareness of um, the climate emergency and communicating the urgency of it. Um, Friends of the Earth, I'm sure, are involved with this, this work as well. I mean, what do you think needs to be done to ensure that the public are aware of the the acute and urgent nature of this emergency and the need for action. Um, what kind of concerted effort is needed? We need this to be taught in schools or is it is it something that should be broader than that, um, part of a broader public initiative? Or are you already involved in something along those lines? Yeah, all of that, you know. Um, uh, yeah, with um, a Friends of the Earth, we're in the middle of producing a resource for um, for schools on on climate, um, and that's near in completion now. But uh, like that depends on um, like teachers that are interested that will take that up and try to like squeeze it in the um, in the class time. You know, like the it hasn't really there is no climate curriculum. I guess hasn't been embraced by the Department for Education. Um, it's not um, compulsory uh, for teachers to to um, teach about climate change. So it's, yeah, you're relying on already overworked um, and a pressured um, teachers. So I was glad to hear that Teach the Future are um, hoping to, to set up here um, and they're working across the water. And their main goal is the campaign for it's organized and, um, and staffed by young people and, and they campaign to uh, get the curriculum changed. So it does reflect our reality basically and, and our future. Um, so that's definitely important. Um, and then on every level, you know, in, in the media, um, you know, in our communities, in our families, you know, we, um, we can be talking about this more and and sometimes it's scary you know and, and well it is scary and because of that maybe um yeah people shy away from it 
because it's overwhelming and, and it's, it's hard to know how to deal with with the pain of seeing how much we're losing. You know, we're in the sixth mass extinction and um, we're losing um, so many species and uh, and habitats and um, and so many people are suffering right now because of the climate crisis. So um, part of the work that we would do um, would be working with, uh, it was a practice called Active Hope, you know, so you um, create a space for people to, to share how they are feeling when looking into these multiple crises that we're facing um, and having a framework to, um, to kind of like widen our perspective for a bit and see kind of the bigger picture and then narrow it back down to see like what's what's mine to do like and and when you have that I suppose it helps you deal with that feeling of being overwhelmed um and it um yeah and having something to act on um is is quite empowering so yeah like what's uh, I asked um someone before who's involved in the global climate um movement and like what's to be done and and he said um anything and everything <laughs> like um do what you can where you are with what you have you know um sounds it... like good advice hmm. kathleen um we're almost done um so i just wanted to i suppose leave everyone with a a, a positive um sense of, of what could be achieved um i mean I think the, the Fridays for Future movement has been hugely inspiring. And um, I think that goes for a lot of people across the world. Um, and I'm just wondering if you wanted to leave people with a sense of hope that things can change for the better in the future. I know that's a large burden to, to, to impose upon you, but I'm, I'm sure you have been really inspired by, um, by colleagues and by the movement as a whole over the last couple of years. I mean, is there anything that you would say to people to either become engaged with the, with the initiative or in terms of how they can deal with the, the climate emergency in, in their own way? Any, any, any suggestions you could make there? Yeah, I think it is, it is a very emotionally rooted topic. It is like, although there is um, the facts and the figures and the science that back it up on it's a very, human level it can be a hard thing to even sort of accept in the first place uh, I think what helped me was actually instead of trying to push it away um, and sort of try and forget about it is actually educate myself a little bit um, do a bit of research and try to engage a little bit with the movement because it makes you feel like at least it's something in your individual life is contributing and helping towards um potentially fixing this issue which i mean is going to affect humanity for generations let alone all the other species that live on this planet as well and thank you caitlin and and anna same question for you i mean i'm i know you've grown enormously within the within the movement and the movement has also grown over the last um couple of years due to the success that that you've had in terms of raising awareness of of the issue is there any kind of any any message you'd like to share with people who might be interested in getting involved or who are already involved and maybe um looking at other ways to to step up their activism well everyone's welcome and everyone's needed as well um like there's no there's something for everyone that's the thing about fridays for future is that you're, if you're good at graphic design and you can design graphics, if you like art, you can paint the signs. If you like text stuff, you can design the website. If you like writing, you can write a blog post. Like there's so many things for everyone. So it doesn't matter what your skill is, what you're interested in, there's something there. And even if you don't know what that skill would be, you're always appreciated and welcome and people can teach you things as well. Um, Fridays to Future is quite unique in the community that there is like everyone is really good friends and everyone knows everyone and it's a really welcoming environment so if you do want to get involved then do it I mean what's stopping you there's no commitment the worst thing that happens is you just you don't come back but trust me you will want to once you try it um I'm primarily motivated by fear but that fear can then be turned into action and then once you see that action it can be hopeful but don't get me wrong, there's very, very little hope when it comes to the climate crisis. So I don't like to push that narrative. 
And the, the practical step of, of making contact with Fridays for Future, and you, you have a website, don't you? And it's possible to make, make contact with the Belfast group through there, through that website? Yeah, there's a website and there's also, um, if you have social media, um, the links in the bios of Twitter and Instagram of the Fridays for Future Northern Ireland page has a link to a sign up form. So you can, if you want to do like active organizing, you can do it through there. And if there's anything to get involved with online, such as the Global Day of Action, which is coming up next week, it's on the 19th of March, and there will be online actions that people can participate in. And things like tweet storms and things like that. So um, if you're looking for like a way to kind of tread the water and take the first step, then participating in the Global Day of Action online would be a really, really good start. And it's next Friday. Please, everyone participate. That was the perfect plug. I couldn't add to that. That was great. Thank you very much. Any last thing you want to say, Linda, um, in terms of from, from your perspective within an NGO? Um, any any kind of hopeful signs that you've seen of a shifting in public attitudes to climate and a greater willingness to get involved, um, particularly at, at government level where it's going to be so crucial. We've got COP COP twenty six coming up as well, or COP twenty six. COP twenty six is coming up in Glasgow soon. So, what are your hopes and expectations around that? Yeah, just to address the first. Sure. Um, yeah, so what has given me hope is to see um, people and communities like taking their power back and away from the system and actually um, just doing it themselves. So, you know, whether that's growing your own food, as many people have, have started over COVID or coming together and creating community energy projects or mutual support or, um, you know, and, and the big structural system changes that are needed, like um, to actually um, get out onto the streets, you know, obviously when possible, but there's other ways of, of um, you know, taking action, um, direct action, civil disobedience, you know, like people are, are um, taking things into their own hands. Um, and that's uh, like, realizing that we have the power the corporations don't have the power they only have like have it if we give it to them um and yeah so to see to see that um is is for me um hugely inspiring um and with cop um yeah i suppose it's an opportunity to uh, to talk about um you know the the climate crisis more and um like i don't have huge hope that um governments will do all they need to do or make the promises that they need to or even if they make the promises to actually follow them follow them through you know um they haven't up to now um so but it's an opportunity to bring more people together to talk about um to talk about the crisis and to try to organize on a um, on a community level, on a grassroots level, to actually um, do something about it. Thank you very much indeed, Linda. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Anna. I think you've all been fantastic. You're all truly inspiring in terms of your activism um, on this issue. Um, thank you for the conversation. And um, I look forward to, to working with you going forward in terms of further actions and uh, awareness raising around climate in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, that was that.